Shalom and welcome. Today, in this video, we're going to be doing Matthew chapter 6. Let's get right into it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Be careful that you don't do your charitable giving before men to be seen by them, or else you have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Therefore, when you do merciful deeds, don't sound a trumpet before yourself, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may get glory from men. Most certainly I tell you that they, they have received their reward. But when you do merciful deeds, don't let your left hand know what your right hand does, so that your merciful deeds may be done in secret. Then your Father who sees in secret will, re will reward you openly." Pretty self-explanatory there. Jesus doesn't want people going around just showing off. You know, we know that he wasn't a, a show off himself. All the great miracles that he did, or at least a good portion of the great, wonderful works that he did, he always went around saying, Shh, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody. Uh, stark contrast uh, to what we see in some of the um, ministries today where if someone gets healed or supposedly gets healed or supposedly has a great uh, miracle happen in their life, the first thing they want to do is, is uh, sound a trumpet and, t and basically show everybody what God has done in their ministry. Um, so yeah, uh, that's basically Jesus is saying, do your good, your good works in secret so that your Father may reward you openly. Basically, trust in God. Don't look for men's approval and men's acceptance. Look for God's approval and God's acceptance. Verse 5, When you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. See, like that's a, that's a, a good point right there, that they may be seen by men. So that's the punchline. Uh, Jesus don't want you to pray publicly that you may be seen by men. Now, he didn't say, don't pray publicly, period, because we know that even he prayed publicly in certain ways and certain circumstances. So the idea here is the motivation. Uh, don't pray publicly so that people would look at you and, you know, say, oh, how, what a wonderful, godly, you know, holy person you are and all this kind of stuff. No. When you pray, pray for the right reason, basically what Yeshua is saying. Don't pray as a hypocrite just for people to recognize you. Okay, most certainly I tell you that they have received their reward. Verse 6, But you, when you pray, enter into your inner room, and having shut, the, shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will re reward you openly. In praying, don't use vain repetitions. Okay, vain repetitions reminds me of a lot of religious practices today. So don't use vain repetitions as the Gentiles do. Very interesting that, uh, you know, Jesus is saying here that the Gentiles pray, okay? There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot to say in regards to what the Bible says about Gentiles. Uh, Yeshua didn't say much good about the Gentiles at all. Uh, in fact, he says, you know, even here it says, don't pray like the Gentiles pray, Um but I find it very interesting that the Gentiles actually prayed. Uh, I mean, because, you know, back in those days, you would think that, you know, the God of Israel, the God of the Bible was basically more or less only uh, found in amongst the Jewish circles. But here we got the Gentiles praying. So in praying, don't use vain repetitions as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their much speaking. Therefore, don't be like them. For your father knows what things you need before you ask before you ask him. Now, this this begs the question, and I know you know some of you, if not a lot of you, have either thought about this before, or you maybe you've asked someone about this before. But the question is, why 
pray. Why even pray if God already knows you have need, okay? So it says here, uh, again, verse 8, Therefore don't be like them, for your Father knows that what things you need before you ask Him. So the question is, and this is what Jesus doesn't directly address here, but the question is, why do you even have to pray at all? You know, the Father knows that you have need of them. Why do you even have to pray? You know, because God knows, you know, and God loves you, right? So he should, you know. So I'm trying to think of a way to do this to try, try to think of a way to teach this in a very... Uh, very fast and, and, and uh, efficient way. When you ask somebody to do something for you, or when you ask somebody in authority to use their authority, okay, what you're doing is you are acknowledging their authority. You are acknowledging them. You are acknowledging their presence. You are acknowledging their abilities, okay? So sometimes, even though God does really, uh, I mean, many times God gives you what you need um, without even asking him. Sometimes you have to ask him, you see, because God wants you to acknowledge him. God wants you to acknowledge his presence. He wants you to acknowledge his power. He wants you to acknowledge his authority, his ability. And so when you don't ask him, sometimes he may not give you what you need unless you ask him because he is requiring of you to to acknowledge to worship him to acknowledge his presence to acknowledge his power to acknowledge his authority you know to acknowledge acknowledge his ability so sometimes yeah um god doesn't answer your prayers because sometimes or sometimes god doesn't doesn't give you what you need because of, I mean, there's many different things. I mean, uh, this is not, this is just one of many different things. Uh, I mean, it could be sin in your life that's caught, that's giving, uh, you know, the enemy legal ground, so to speak, in your life. But uh, also because, you know, God wants you to acknowledge him, to ask him, to ask. Uh, in asking, you, it, it's, there's power in asking. Um, even though the person that you're asking may already know that you need what you're asking for, there's power in, in, in asking. Verse 9, pray like this. Okay, this is what they call the Lord's Prayer. Um, verse 9, pray like this. Our Father in heaven. Now, you got to think about it now. A lot of the people that he spoke to did not consider God to be their Father, their true Father. So when he said, pray like this, our Father in heaven, and that is um, not unusual because we see that in the, in the Old Testament, that idea that God is Father. But in a more commonplace way to, to look at God as your Father and to pray uh, to God as speaking to your Father is, uh, is something that we don't see much of uh, you know, uh, in the mainstream Jewish mindset back in those days. May your name be kept holy, or hallowed be thy name. Holy meaning separate, meaning you're separate from the world, acknowledging that God is separate from the world, that his ways, that his, you know, the name, there's so much, that that means when you say name, your name be holy. And it's not just talking about, a, a, you know, a literal word. Name is, is really referring to what that, you know, a name of a person is really referring to what that person is all about, what that person represents. Um, so may your name be kept holy. In other words, you know, there's the idea of not mixing his ways, his will with the secular, you know, the secularism, okay? There's no mixing. There's holiness to be, you know, holiness to be preserved. Not to be mixed with the world, not to be mixed with the common thing. Our Father, 
you know, preserve your holiness or may your name be kept holy or hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Again, this idea of kingdom is not so much a geographical thing or a, you know, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, political thing per se, but it is the idea that of letting God be king in your life, rule over you. And like I said many times before, you cannot be in a kingdom without being under the rule of somebody. And you cannot be under the rule of somebody without being subject to the laws of that particular kingdom. It's just the way it is. Okay, God has laws. Uh, it's in the scriptures, all the way through the scriptures. And so that is what we're supposed to use as our blueprint for life for life and, and living and, and thinking. Um, so yeah, pray like this, uh, our Father in heaven, holy is your name, or may your name be kept holy. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So here we got Yeshua saying that we should pray that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So there's power in the fleshly or the material human being on earth verbalizing their not only their consent but their uh their request their in, in you know inquiry or request that god god's will be done here on earth as it is in heaven okay and you think about it now how many people actually got saved? How many people actually really came to the Lord or, or you know, really uh, heard the message of the gospel, got saved, you know, you know, read the Bible or all this, all this kind of thing without somebody somewhere in the background praying for them? I mean, I was amazed when, uh, when I got saved, I came to the Lord and it was so many people that uh, came up to me and said, you know, I saw you around, I saw you around and, and I was praying for you. And I'm like, I don't even know who you are. Uh, and you, you were praying for me. You were praying that I got, you know, that I would get saved. And so, you know, I think that there were God, apart from creation, how many times did God actually move, do something powerful without someone on earth, material, you know, uh, physical human being on earth actually praying for it okay verbalizing their um you know their request so i mean in another gospel and in some other translations you would hear uh, you know jesus would say this is how you pray when you pray say okay so there's power in actually speaking the words with your physical lips it it brings uh, the spiritual into the physical realm, okay? It, there's a lot of power in that. And, and that's a whole video all by itself. So I just wanted to touch on that. Uh, yeah, like, again, just step back here. How many times did God actually move apart from creation without man actually praying? I mean, you know, we got Noah's flood. Um, it says... Uh, uh, in uh, in the Apocrypha, actually, in the ancient, doc ancient documents, that because of the violence that was on the earth uh, in, in those days, the prayers of those who were perishing went up to God, and God heard the prayers of men, and that's why he, he re responded by sending the flood. You think about Sodom and Gomorrah. It says that the prayers of the people went up against Sodom and Gomorrah to heaven. And God responded by saying, let's go down and take a look and see if what the prayers are really true of what's, go you know, is it really true that this place is so bad as what they say it is? Um, you know, and on and on and on and on it goes. Uh, when God moves mightily, it's because of the prayers of his people. And a lot of times you got to wonder whether or not God moves at all without the physical, literal, um, human, you know, human element 
that's actually in uh, in the in the mix praying literally verbalizing their request before God so let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven verse 11 give us today our daily bread we need to pray for our needs verse 12 Forgive us our debts or our sins, our trespasses, sins, as we forgive our debtors. Or again, trespasses or sins, um, basically meaning all the same thing. Bring us not into temptation. Okay, so this particular element of this prayer, you are acknowledging that God is on the throne and that there's nothing that can happen apart from him. Okay, Satan cannot move. The devil cannot tempt you without him, without God's allowing it, or in a lot of instances, initiating it. Let's say in in the book of Job, or even in the book of, or even let's say, for example, with uh, Saul, uh, you know, uh, King Saul, God sent him, uh, sent to him an evil spirit. Uh, We got. You know, we read earlier in earlier videos and earlier chapters how God led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. Okay, so the prayer here is bring us not into temptation. So that's acknowledging that God is in charge, that God is in, you know, he's in on, you know, he's on the throne no matter what. Uh, And he can, uh, you know, uh, he can set up circumstances in your life where it can be a horrible thing for you, you know, based upon uh, his will, uh, his sovereign will, you know, because of something going on in your life, because of what you need to learn, because of your sin, your punishment, whatever the case may be. But the prayer here is, bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Or some translations say, deliver us from evil, okay? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The NU uh, manuscripts, which are uh, presumed or not presumed, but uh, arguably the earliest manuscripts, omits the whole phrase, for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay. So there is a reason why some people would believe that this whole phrase, for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen was actually added at a later date that it wasn't actually originally taught that we should say that. Although it's not bad that we should say that by any means, okay? Um, Verse 14. For if you forgive men your trespasses. Now, this is very powerful. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Ladies and gentlemen, forgiveness is key. Forgiveness is key to getting the blessings of God, to getting the forgiveness of God, to be allowed into heaven, so to speak. Okay, Forgiveness is key. Without forgiveness, it says God will not, for, will not forgive you. How can you expect God to let you into heaven? How can you expect God to let you into his kingdom if he is still holding sin against you? You know, Revelation is very clear. Not one iota of sin, no sin, darkness, evil of any sort, no unforgiven sin is allowed into heaven. Okay? So if you don't forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. There is a, a testimony of a pastor in Africa that uh, he he said that he w- got in a car accident. He passed away and um, and God took him to heaven and showed him around heaven. Actually, the, he said it was a couple angels that took him to heaven. And then the, angel, the angels took him to hell. And as soon as he saw hell, he said the angels said to him, if you were to die i mean you died but if your if your life were to if the books of your life were were closed were to be closed permanently this would be your lot this would be your lot and that pastor was shaken he was absolutely shocked he's like wait a second i'm a pastor i preach the gospel i know the gospel i believe in the gospel not not only that but i'm a tongue talking you know born again christian what do you mean i'm going to hell i would go to hell if i really died and you know permanently died 
Uh, and the angel said, yes, but listen, you have not forgiven your wife. You were in an argument before you, before you were in the car accident and you did not forgive your wife. You still hold this grudge against her. And because of that, God holds, holds your sins against you and you, this will be your place. It's like, wow. Okay. That is according to what Jesus said. Okay. That lines up with scripture. Okay, so it's very, very serious to forgive men their trespasses. Now, what you need to do, if you haven't done this, everybody who is hearing me, everybody within the sound of my voice, you need to take time out and you need to go and you need to ask God, show me, show me the faces of everyone that has ever done any evil things against me in all of my life. Show me, tell me the people, give me names, give me faces of people who have done evil against me or evil against my loved ones or evil against other people. And I'm, and I'm holding a grudge against these people. Show me names of everybody who's holding that I'm holding a grudge against so that I may forgive them. And God will show you. <laughs> God will show you. If, if I know there's a lot of people today that claim to hear God's voice. I'm telling you, if you want to hear God's voice, ask him to show you your sin. Okay. If you really want to hear God's voice, that's one prayer he for sure will answer if you're honest. Okay? Show me your sin, Lord. Or show me my sin, Lord. You know, pray to God. Show me where I'm, people that I need to forgive. And faces and, you know, names will come to you. When they do, say this to, say this to, um, to God. Pray like this. Say, Father, I forgive and name the person for and name the offense okay be specific don't just kind of just say father i forgive johnny for being a bad boy it's too general okay be specific okay god will honor that okay and go through the list of everybody you need to forgive people that have done things against you people that have you know that you hold a grudge against and people that have done things against other people that you hold a grudge, you hold a grudge against these people. Whatever the case may be, people uh, that you need to forgive, okay? Go through the list, and I guarantee you, you will step into another level of, of, of God's presence, His Spirit, His blessing. Guaranteed. Guaranteed, okay? I mean, Jesus said this before. Uh, you back up to uh, verse... Um, Verse 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. <coughs> Excuse me. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Okay, so Jesus made this clear. We need to pray that, that God forgive us as we forgive. Okay, verse 14, he reiterated it. Verse 14, he rehashed it, saying, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, Neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. Now, once again here, uh, just before I move on, a lot of you need to ask God to show you things that your father did and your mother did that you need to forgive. Okay? Very, very, very important. Extreme, crucial to your spiritual well-being. Say your father wasn't there for you. Or your father uh, wasn't a father for you. Or maybe he was there in the home and he never really fathered you properly. Um, or whatever he may have done. Or, you know, maybe you don't even know him. Whatever the case is, ask God to show you specifics of how you should pray and what you should do to forgive. Now, finally, I want to make it clear what it means to forgive. Now, Forgiving is not necessarily forgetting. Although forgiving can lead to forgetting, forgiving is not necessarily forgetting. Forgiving is just not holding that, you know, not holding someone um, responsible for, uh, for what they've done wrong. Or forgiving is basically just letting them off the hook. Forgiving is just not... You know, if you, for, if, for example, if you forgave Johnny for stealing 50 bucks from you, it just means that you, you don't hold that against him anymore, okay? It doesn't mean that you forget it. It's just that you just say, yes, he did, but, 
you know, I'm not, I'm letting him free on that. I'm not holding that against him anymore. I'm not, I'm not going behind his back, you know, telling everybody how bad of a person he is and, and just, you know, slandering him or whatever. I'm just forgiving him about it. Okay. Or forgiving him for it. So forgiving is just letting the people off the hook. It's not necessarily forgetting, although forgetting is just an added bonus. If you can forget it, great. Uh, if not, at least forgive, okay? That is, uh, that is the commandment of the Lord, to forgive. Verse 16, moreover, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. When, when you fast, he doesn't say if you fast. He said when you fast, okay? So God expects you to fast, at certain periods in your life, you need to fast or certain periods in, you know, of the year, of the month or whatever, whatever the case may be, whatever is on your heart, whatever you need to do, uh, you need to fast. When, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites with sad faces. Why would they have sad faces? Um, you know, Jesus goes on to explain it. For they disfigure their faces. Ugh, they make themselves look sad and, you know, forlorn. That they may be seen by men to be fasting. Oh, take a look at me, how much I'm suffering, how much I'm, oh, look at how much, how holy I am that I'm fasting. That's what Jesus is talking about, okay? He didn't tell you not to fast, just like he doesn't tell you not to pray in public. He just says, when you do it, don't do it for the, you know, with the motivation to be seen so that people would recognize you as some, somebody who is holier than you really are. Okay, that's hypocrite. More, uh, most certainly I tell you that they have received the reward. But when you fast, again, when here, when you fast, anoint your head and your face. In other words, look good. Look, look, don't make yourself look so, uh, oh, look what I'm doing. Oh, poor me, pity me, pamper me. You know, oh, look, I'm, I'm fasting. No, no, no. Make yourself look good. Like everything's great, right? So that when, so that, you are not seen by men to be fasting, but by your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Verse 19, don't lay up treasures for yourself on the earth. Oh, how many people today do this, okay? Uh, especially in developed nations. Don't lay up treasures for yourself on the earth, okay? Don't forget, you're mortal. You're only here, you're only visiting. You're only here for a short period of time. Okay, uh, you think about it, even 100 years is really not that long. Okay, if you live to be 120 years old or whatever the case would be, it's really still not all that long, really. Um, you know, a year goes by fast, 10 years go by fast, you know, decades go by fast. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume. In other words, everything's going to come to dust, okay? Everything, if it's not eaten up by insects, it's going to be eaten up by natural decomposition rust. Or thieves will break in and steal, it says, verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consume and thieves don't break in, bro break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, Okay. So as Paul said, set your affections on things above. Don't set your affections on things on earth because everything on earth, everything that's earthly will, is corruptible, will go back to the earth, go back to dust. And so what's, what's Yeshua saying here? And how do you lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven? Well, I mean, Jesus spoke about giving to the poor. The whole Bible, the whole scope of Scripture speak about giving alms, giving to the poor, and how that is basically part of laying up treasure in heaven. Another thing is, too, laying up treasure in heaven is to do what you're doing now. Listen to the Word of God. Think about what you're, what you're reading. Think, you know, read the Scriptures. Think about what you're reading. Think about it day and night. Think about it all the time. Laying up treasures in heaven, okay? Think about the word and doing the word. And like James, like James said, don't be like someone who looks at the mirror and then goes away and forgets all about what you, you know, what you look like. When you come to the scriptures, look at it, and it you will you will see yourself in the scriptures. It will show you for who you really are. Don't walk away and forget who you really, what you really look like. Okay, um, you know, go away and do things to better yourself. Okay. 
Verse 22, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is sound or good or healthy, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? In other words, if, if you, if the so-called, if you, the light if your light is darkness, how dark would the darkness be? I mean, if that, if your light is dark, how dark is your darkness, okay? Um, yeah, it's very important to keep your eyes on things that are good, both spiritually, physically, in every way. Uh, again, this involves also keeping your eyes in the Word of God, in the Scriptures. As, it's, as David said in the Psalms, Your word have I hidden within me so that I might not sin against you, speaking to God. So we need to hide the Word of God in us. We need to have it in us. We need to know the Scriptures by heart. We need to just know it off by heart, and again, do it. Don't be like the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the, hip, or the scribes that a lot of them, not all of them, uh, you know, we've read about some, and Paul himself said he's, he is a Pharisee. He never said that he repented. You know, in Philippians, he says, I am a Pharisee. He never said I was a Pharisee. He said I am. Paul himself, Nicodemus. There are there were are there, you know there are some Pharisees that you could be you know can you can consider them to be good Pharisees, um, for what that is. Okay. Verse twenty four. No one can serve two masters, for neither he for either he will hate the one or love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and Mammon. You can't serve both God and money. Oh, again, how many people today, even people who go to church, even people who can, you know, consider themselves to be men and women, ch children of faith, um, actually serve money. They don't serve God. They serve money. Yeah, so you, you can't serve uh, both God and money. You got to serve God. God only, and he will, look, he will look after everything else, okay? Verse 25, verse 25, Therefore I tell you, don't be anxious for your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor yet for your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more important than food and body more, the body more important than clothing? See the birds of, this, of the sky that they don't sow, Neither do they reap. You never see a bird come with a seed in his mouth, a seed in his beak, and plant the seed and come back later to reap it. No, uh, they don't gather into barns. You don't go around and say, "Oh, there's a bird barn." No, uh, they don't do that. They uh, they just live. Okay, uh, your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you of much more value than they? Which of you, by being anxious or by worrying, can add one moment or literally one cubit? A cubit is uh, literally uh, a, st uh, a measurement from the, from the tip of your elbow to the, to the tip of your fingers, okay? From your elbow to your fingers, which is approximately 18 inches, okay? Which of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit or one moment to his lifespan, Okay. Why are you so, why are you, are you anxious about clothing? You know, there's a lot of people that are anxious about clothing. Oh, what am I going to wear? What, you know, what am I going to buy for clothing? You know, all this kind of stuff. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toil. You don't say, oh, look at those lilies. They're working hard for their clothes. They're, they're really working hard. Look at them working up a sweat there. Oh, you better tell them to take a break. You know? No, they don't toil, nor neither do they spin, right? You don't say, oh, look at that beautiful daffodil. That daffodil is spinning a nice sweater for itself. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his glory, Solomon, it, was, it says Solomon had was the richest man that ever lived and or ever will live. Uh he had like everything was gold. I mean, everything was gold with him. I mean, you know, uh, Virtually speaking, uh, or, you know, in essence, everything was gold, okay? He had more gold that you could shake a stick at. Uh, but even Solomon, in all of his glory, in all of the beauty, in, in all of the riches that he had, was not dressed like one of these. You know, even the lilies of the field were more beautiful than what, all of what Solomon had. But if, or at least how Solomon dressed, okay? But if God clothes the grass of the field, which today exists... And tomorrow is thrown into the oven. How much more clothe you, you of little faith? Okay? God will take care of your clothing. 
Don't even worry about it. Verse 31, therefore, don't be anxious saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will, what will, what will we be clothed? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Okay. Once again, here we got uh, you know Jesus referring to the Gentiles and not a very positive light. Okay. And how many Christians today, you know, they say, I'm a Gentile, I'm a Gentile. Well, you know what? If you are really part of Christ, you're part of the Jew, you know. You're, Jesus is 100% Jewish. If you are one with him, you are one with the Jew. You are Jewish. <laughs> it's no way, no other way to say it. If you are one with Christ, you are Jewish because he is 100% Jewish. He's the vine. He says, you are the branches. If the vine is 100% Jewish, you are, you know, deriving everything, your entire life, everything about you is, you're part of the Jewish vine. Okay. So yeah, Jesus doesn't have much really good to say about Gentiles. Verse 33, but seek first God's kingdom. Okay, this is, the, this is the bottom line. Yeshua says, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. Okay, here we go. God's kingdom, letting God rule over you and his righteousness. God's righteousness. What does that mean? Okay. Righteousness means it's the state of being right, being right, according to some law, okay? Everybody has in their own mind their own righteousness, okay? Even people who claim to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ, they have their own little doctrine, their own little righteousness. They have their own way of thinking how they are right in, the, in what they believe, in what they do. Uh, that's their righteousness, okay? Righteousness is based upon a law. Whatever nation you're living in right now, whatever na nation you're in where you're, you're watching this video or you're hearing this, uh, this audio um, uh, recording, that nation has a, a, a standard for righteousness. It's not God's standard, if it, you know, unless Yeshua is back already on earth. And I, I guarantee you, I mean, he probably isn't if you're not listening to this or if you are listening to this. But every nation has a standard of its own righteousness, which is defined by its criminal code or by its law, by its uh, constitution, whatever the case may be. Um, and every person has its own, have their own righteousness. But God has his righteousness, which is laid out for us and defined by his law, which is defined, which is, recorded for us in scripture, okay? So when, when, when Jesus said, seek first God's kingdom, okay, which, is, which means, first of all, you better be concerned about being in God's kingdom, being part of his people, again, being part of the Jewish vine, being part of Messiah, being part of him, okay? Being in his kingdom, being ruled by the king, not by yourself, not by your own, not by your pastor, not by your boss, but by the king, by God himself. That's God's kingdom. And his righteousness. So seek his righteousness, which means find out what he says is right and what's wrong. Find out what God says is right, what God says is wrong. Pretty simple. Everybody would tell you what they think is right and what they think is wrong. Regardless of how lawless they may be, everybody has a standard of righteousness. Everybody has their own law, okay? I don't care who it is, okay? Um, God has his own law too, and that is his righteousness. So Yeshua said, seek to be in his kingdom, to be under his rule, and seek his righteousness, to know what's right and wrong according to his law, and to go on the right side, okay? Uh, to be... To do, as James said again, Yaakov, as he said, not just to read the scriptures, but to do it. That is his righteousness. Um, when you become, when you do, then you are, you have his righteousness, because you're doing it. it it's all uh, in, in the act of uh, uh, of of doing. Um, 
Yeshua made it very clear in Matthew chapter 25. He will judge on the last day between you know, from who's going to heaven, who's going to hell, based upon what they do or do not do. Revelation makes it very clear as well. Uh, that is how people are going to be judged. That's how everybody's going to be judged. Jesus said it many times over. Verse 34. Okay, well, excuse me, let's back up here. I forgot the last half of verse 33. He said, but seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. In other words, get your priorities straight. Don't think about getting the new, latest, greatest, most expensive clothes. Don't think about getting, you know, the, don't think about, well, what am I going to eat now? You know, I'm just worried about what I'm going to eat. Be anxious about what you're eating. Don't worry about that. Be, ang- be if, if I can use the word anxious, but seek first God, his kingdom, and his righteousness, which is laid out for us in his standards, in his laws, his precepts. Seek first that first. Then God will take care of all the rest. That would be, a, Jesus is saying, make that a priority. Uh, verse 34, therefore, don't be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Each day, Each day's own evil is sufficient. Each day has enough trouble of its own, is what Yeshua is saying. Okay, so uh, again, um, may God bless you with with revelation. Uh, May God deepen your understanding of the scriptures as we go through these scriptures. Thanks for watching, and um, you know, God give you great revelation, great blessing, and uh, think about His Word as you go through your day, as you go through your evening into your night. Thanks again for watching. God bless.